Let's take our Bibles to uh, chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. And uh, I, I want to introduce, uh, in fact, the Fellowship Sunday is a time for us to um, kind of synchronize the services. I have heard uh, many rumors that, that I don't say the same thing in first service as I say in second service, and that's true. It's very true. Uh, it's, they're completely different services. Uh, uh, the reason I know that is there's completely different people in both services, and I really uh, um, change depending on who the, the group of people is that are there. But we are syncing the Revelation series today, and you're all going to hear the same thing, I hope. And, and so it'll help you be in the same spot as we go forward. The question this morning is, why would God want every church, every church of Jesus Christ, of every generation, to study what you're holding in front of you this morning, the revelation of Jesus Christ, this final book. And I want you to think about that with me because the book of the Revelation has always been regarded by all who have ever taught it as unlike any other book in the Bible. I mean, they even have its own designation. It's called apocalyptic literature. It just doesn't fit in any other genre of the types of literature that the Bible has. Revelation is not only the ending to God's word, Revelation is an invitation from God. And that's part of why God wants us to study it. But to prepare for our overview of, and we're going to, to synchronize this, we're going to look at all 17 verses of chapter 6. But to prepare for that, I want you to look with me at the very beginning of the book. And you don't have to turn in your Bibles because I'm going to put it up here because I want you to see together with me, looking up rather than uh, looking down, at the emphasis that God makes as we read this. So we're going to read the first eight verses. So let's stand together, uh, and we're going to read together. You follow along the words, and we're going to read out loud together, and that means you're all going to be blessed because it says in the Bible, those that hear, those that read, and those that do get blessed. So all you have to do is read and hear reading, and in your heart say, this is what I want to do. And, and you and I together will be blessed. So let's read in unison. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God, and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for the blessing, the blessing to read your word, to even have it, the blessing to hear all of our voices blended together, and then the privilege to be blessed as we do 
the things that are written in your word. Teach us how to do, how to respond to you, O oh God, we pray. And I ask for the promised anointing of your spirit that each of us believers have, that you teach us your truth. May you do that today as we look at it, as we decide if we want to be blessed by obeying it. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, God sent the book of Revelation. And, and as you see these words we read, they emphasize the glory and power of Christ. But that isn't where it ends. It isn't just so that the glory and power of Christ can be emphasized. It's so that we, his church, can, number one, have bold prayers. You know, every time, in fact, uh, the, the little people that were, and there's, uh-oh, someone left their card. Uh, still their parents, uh, but you can get one later. But at the end of it, on the palm of that little hand down there on the platform, it says, in Jesus' name, amen. And sometimes we just rattle right through that. And we don't think about how incredible it is that we can boldly come in our prayers. Now, it says in Hebrews 4, we come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy, and we find help. But boldness in prayer so we can see and follow and trust Jesus Christ as the Almighty, the Son, that's the message of Revelation 1's immense description of Christ risen, glorified, and now unveiled. That's who he is. And Revelation 1 is so much telling us that when we pray, that's who we're talking to. You know, the last time most people saw Christ, he was lifeless, drained of his blood, pallid, and dead with a spear thrust through his side. That's how all but those 500 believers that saw him after the resurrection, everyone else, like about 99.999% of people, that's the last time they saw Jesus Christ. And you know, people in the succeeding generations of the church might be slowly influenced to think of him that way. That's why we, we have nothing on our cross. We don't have a dead, lifeless Christ on a crucifix because that was one sacrifice forever that is once and for all done. We remember him this way in chapter 1. He is alive. He is risen. He is no longer humbled. He's no longer in the form of a servant. He is omnipotent. He is almighty. We should think of him as the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And that's whom we love and serve and trust today. So number one, bold prayers. Number two, God sent the book of Revelation to emphasize something else for us, the church. And that is that we need to focus our ministries, the, the things we do in our life, with what synchronizes with what Christ wants. Now think about that. We can know that almighty Jesus Christ is watching and working with his churches. That's what chapter 2 and 3 is all about. That's why we spent so long. In fact, personally, I, I was just on Thursday night at the elder board meeting telling him that, that the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are some of the most profoundly vital verses in the Bible. Do you know why? Jesus, who came and suffered and bled and died and launched his church, sent out an army, a legion of, of apostles and of those that they led to Christ, fanning out across the world. Then he inspired his, his authors, those New Testament writers, to write how he wanted things done in the church. And all that, I'm talking about from AD 30 all the way through the first generation of the church, through the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and as the church fanned out through all the persecutions of the Roman Empire. And that's wonderful, and we can read all the epistles and look at it and read the little letters to churches. But you know what you wonder? You wonder is, well, does the Lord like it the way that Paul told the Corinthians to do it or the way they told the Colossians to do it or the way he told the Philippians to do it? And we would always wonder, which church was the one that was really doing it right? But Jesus comes back to Patmos and inspires John to write down the report of how the churches were doing. 
Chapter 2 and 3 are the most vital for us in the church because they show us what the risen, glorified king who walks in his church is looking for. And that's what we're supposed to focus our ministries on. Paul said Jesus is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. Jesus is the almighty savior of the church. There is no limit to what he wants to do. Nothing is too hard for him in our personal lives, our family lives, our ministry lives. That's who we abide in. Jesus, who is almighty God, the Son. That's who we pray to, and that's who we serve every day. Well, thirdly, not only focused ministries, but God sent this book of the Revelation to show us the ending. The ending of the church. What, what, what is the ultimate ending, the destination? What, what is God's plan? I've told you many times, I can still, even thinking about it, I can still hear the little voices behind me. You know, being surrounded by those kids just now made me think about it. For many years, we traveled around with eight little people in the car. And what I would hear all the time is, where are we going? When are we going to get there? What are we doing? You know, that's just part of humanity. We're curious. God says, here, for you to know and live confidently, you can see what will happen when Jesus Christ returns for his bride, the church, to bring them around God's throne. That's chapter 4 and chapter 5. Those two chapters show us what God's plan is for us and for everybody that we lead to Jesus Christ, to everyone that we get to point to Christ, share the gospel with, and that they respond to Christ. We see our destination and our, our preoccupation around the throne but also so we can see what happens when the almighty Jesus, remember the last time the world saw him, he was dead and lifeless and pallid and cold and drained of his blood, but they're going to see him again. And the Lord wants us to see what happens when the almighty Jesus, the judge, returns to the world as king to pour out his wrath on sinners and to rescue Israel. You know, God sovereignly elected Israel and he said, I have future plans for those people. Even if they don't believe it now, even if they think they're really something now, they're going to come to the point where they cry out to me. Jesus has designated every stage of his return. First, people are allowed to be as bad as they want to be, and the world goes crazy, and a quarter of all the people die. Then Jesus begins to unleash the wrath of God, and then the world shakes, and people cower, and Jesus returns in blazing fire to take his vengeance on rebels. That's what God wanted us all to see. That's what God wants us to understand. That's the purpose of this book. So that we have these confident lives. We know how it ends. We know how it turns out. We know what's coming. All sin will be dealt with. No one will escape. They will all stand before the great white throne of God's judgment. Well, God's plan for the future is pictured for us in the book of Revelation. It's, it's the, the point where it's kind of like the motherboard. It's the center where everything that God started in Genesis, everything he sends through all those 40 apostles and prophets that wrote his word, all finds its connection in the book of Revelation. So, Almost every Bible teacher who interprets the scriptures normally. Now, let me just want to. I got a note last night. Um, I got a lot of notes last night, but I got one last night that was really neat. It was from someone that always sat right in the front uh, of one of the churches that I pastored. It, he was a front rower, you know, kind of like Tim, front row Tim Pedrolini there. But, uh, but this guy always sat right there. And, um, and, I mean, he started praying for me year or months before I ever came to that church. I don't know how he knew he started calling me and emailing me. And now he emails me all the time. He's always saying, I'm praying for you Sunday. I mean, it was really nice. But he, he sent me a note last night, and he said, I wish I was going to be in, in the fellowship service. He said, because I like to understand the Bible. Now, let me, look what it says on the screen. Almost every Bible teacher who interprets the scriptures normally. Did you know if, if you go somewhere tonight for dinner or tomorrow if you go somewhere for dinner and they hand you a menu, do you know you would read that menu normally? 
You wouldn't think everything on it means something other than what it says. If you pick up any piece of paper, any magazine, any newspaper, if you see a billboard driving home today, you don't go, I don't think that means what it says. We normally believe that what we read, it might not be true, but it means what it says. Did you know that's the normal way that scriptures are to be interpreted? The way we would any other thing we read. We, if we read the Bible normally, if you just say God's trying to communicate something to us and it's not some huge secret that, that he's cloaked in all kinds of terms, you can never understand it. If you read it normally, you would come to the conclusion that all the prophecies in the Old Testament about Israel as a nation are just like the events described in Revelation 6 to 19. What are those events like? They're all events in the future. Did you know since the church has started reading the book of Revelation when it was copied out of Ephesus and sent outward because Ephesus was kind of like what Grand Rapids used to be. Grand Rapids used to be the book publishing center for Christendom. I mean, all of the commentaries and all of the, the books surrounding Christianity were just clustered in, in Grand Rapids, you know, Erdman's and Baker and, and Zondervan and everybody else. And of course, now all that is shifted offshore, most of the publication, but Ephesus was the Grand Rapids of many centuries ago. And when the letter from Christ through John to the church went to Ephesus. It fanned out and was copied. And when people got that, do you know they read it like it was normal? And they said, these are future events, just like what it says in the Old Testament, the future plans. Why do you think the disciples kept saying, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? When are you going to restore? They read the Bible normally. They knew that there were a whole bunch of promises about the nation of Israel that had never happened. So they're all events in the future, and that's how they were plainly described in both places, in the Old Testament and Revelation 6. They're events in the future, they're events that are unique, and they're events that are global. And so a plain and normal treatment of God's Word necessitates if God sovereignly elected a group of people and said, this is everything I'm going to do to you and for you, and those things haven't happened, you don't transfer that to a different group of people and say he didn't mean what he said. And, and when he talks about land, he's talking about something else. When he talks about, you know, making your crops grow, he's meaning making your church grow. That is not normal. That's called allegory. And it's a wrong way to interpret plain, normal scripture. Well, a plain and simple normal treatment of God's word necessitates we distinguish clearly between God's plans for Israel and for the church. And, and for you to understand, when, when I read and explain and teach, my perspective on explaining God's word could be described as interpreting the scriptures consistently in the normal, plain sense that they're written, using a literal, grammatical, historical method, but from the the essence of what the scriptures teach, that these are future events. So I would teach them from a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial perspective. So what are the clear events? If you have the book of Revelation before you, what are the events that are plain as day? Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are about Christ's church on earth. In fact, 20 sometimes it says church, 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 church. All of a sudden, church stops. And the second division of the clear elements of this book are Christ's church all of a sudden is in heaven. You see them. Who are they? They're redeemed. Their sins are forgiven. They're thanking the Lord for what he has done for them, and they're surrounding the throne. And so just a plain normal reading would be church, 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 church for three chapters, and all of a sudden church, 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 church is there. And it's the church in heaven, and you see them being referred to again in chapter 19. Thirdly, the tribulation events in heaven and on earth make up the bulk of this book. And that's where we happen to be. The return of the king is all about this period of time, Revelation 6 to 18. And then we come to Christ's second coming, which, where he is called king of kings and lord of lords, and where he comes, and, and the Bible says he has all of the saints. When he comes, before he gets here, before he comes, all of the saints are riding behind him. Well, that's a quandary for people that say the second coming is for him to get the saints. 
they're already with him. In fact, that's the first prophecy in the Bible. Enoch said, Behold, the Lord comes with myriads of myriads of his saints to execute judgment. He said the tribulation judgments are going to be executed by the Lord who already has his saints that are coming with him. Then, the fifth of the clear events that are chronicled in this book is Christ's earthly millennial rule. I mean, some of the longest passages of the Old Testament about a future rule talk about Jesus on earth with his people ruling this place, not somewhere else, here on earth. Even the second psalm talks about his ruling with a rod of iron. That's in Revelation 20. Then there's a rebellion. And what's amazing is uh, that, that the God goes green, by the way. You know, he, he makes the earth uh, ecologically wonderful. I mean, there's no poison and no venom and there's no carnivorous and there's no anything. It's like even, even the curse starts rolling back and we're almost in a utopia during that time. When God runs the earth, it's like paradise. But even a perfect environment doesn't make people perfect because we have a flaw on the inside. We are sinners. By nature, by choice, and because God declared us that way. But we are sinners, and so the sinners rebel. And that kicks off the great white throne, and then eternity starts. So, let's look at this. And I was working on this, and I'm glad Bonnie's in the nursery, because she was chuckling at my chart. Okay, because I've never made a chart before, so I'm making you a chart. You know, you've heard that a picture's worth a thousand words. I don't believe Revelation was written to make a chart out of. So I'm not making a chart out of it. I'm just showing you what I just said in graphic form. So I'll show you. First, the book of Revelation talks about the church on earth. That's Revelation 1 through 3. Then Revelation talks about the church in heaven. And that is an amazing event. And uh, a little glistening is nothing compared to what it's going to be like to be around that throne. And to know that we are forgiven. And to know that we get to worship the one who loved us and loosed us from our sins. And to see all that lightning and thunder and all the, the, the voices from the throne and, and everything that's going on. But the next thing that, that the Bible talks about is the tribulation. And that is the time of God's wrath on the earth. When he smites the earth with the plagues that sin deserves, that he's always withheld. You know, people have always said, if there's a God in heaven, why doesn't he do something? He's going to. And when he does, everyone pays attention and they notice. The fourth event is Christ's second coming. Now you say, what's all that? Well, it says in the Bible in first or in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, that he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on sinners. The characteristic of the second coming of Christ is not blessing. It's, it's a vengeance. It's of wrath. It's of flaming fire. In fact, someone once said that the most expensive real estate in the world is going to be a hole in the ground when Christ comes because everyone's going to be looking for a place to hide. Because they're going to see that flaming fire and they're going to see the fire in his eyes and they're going to feel the impending doom of the wrath. And by the way, he lands uh, right there on the Mount of Olives, that little... Uh, triangle in the center at the beginning was the Mount of Olives, which is kind of the very center of uh, all of God's plans. That's where Jesus ascended from. That's where he's coming back to. Well, that takes us through God going green. I mean, I mean, it's green everywhere. I mean, you just don't, get, don't print your statement. Get electronic. Don't mail it, you know. So recycle everything. Save the earth, you know, and keep it nice. Well, I can assure you it will not be nice till the Creator comes back and cleans it up. I mean, you ought to see what's going on in China. Uh, You know, we were just there in April, and I just saw a slideshow of, I mean, that it's not just Beijing that's polluted. I mean, there are cities where they're taking all of our electronic gear like this, and, and they're actually, with little hammers, cracking and breaking in pieces the motherboards, and with tweezers taking all the metals out so they can reuse them to build them for us again. And their entire cities and and hundreds of thousands of people that are dying of cancer from ingesting all of this horrible stuff. And that's just a a little microcosm of what's going on all over the world. But God comes back and makes it all nice and new for a thousand years. 
But at the end of the thousand years, man still rebels, which proves that a perfect environment doesn't make perfect people. And so that leads to the great white throne, and what is at the great white throne is the lake of fire. And I saw the dead, small and great, and the books were open. And whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast, literally, into the lake of fire. And then we go from there into dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And by the way, the little star, Bonnie said, that looks like a birthday candle, honey. I said, thanks a lot, honey. I intentionally, that is a 12-pointed star to remind us of the 12 gates and the 12 foundation stones. And that heaven is gold, you know. And so, well, I worked hard on it. Okay, what are Revelation's seven clear events? Christ's church on earth, Christ's church in heaven, tribulation events in heaven and earth, Christ's second coming, his millennial rule, the final rebellion, eternity, and heaven. Now, there are two big events, though, that we need to think about because I want to put into the framework of Revelation the other two events that Jesus talked about, John talked about, Luke talked about, Paul added to the amazing panorama of the future. Now, they're in Revelation, but you have to understand them outside the book of Revelation because they're not described within the book of Revelation because from chapter 6 on is so focused on the wrath of God that you would get to what's going on in chapter 4 and 5 and, and without knowing what Paul added because Paul said it was a mystery. And those events are the rapture of the church and the Bema seat, judgment of believers. Now, John, the apostle, records Jesus promising a place for us. Who is the us? It's the ones that receive him as the way, the truth, and the life. That's the believers, the people that come to Christ, the people that are evangelized and become a part of his church on earth and in heaven. And he said that he's going to prepare a place for us, John 14, he's coming back to take us home. And so the, the first promise is from Jesus. Well, then Luke 24 adds that Jesus left the same group. Now think about this. Jesus left from the Mount of Olives. Remember the little black thing that was in the middle of my chart? He left from the Mount of Olives in an event seen only by them. Do you realize the people in Jerusalem didn't see this? After the resurrection, Jesus was never seen by anything but loving eyes. He was never touched by anything but loving hands. It was intentional. Because that event, seen only by them, was while he blessed them, he was taken up in the clouds. And Luke's sequel is the book of Acts. And Luke continues in Acts chapter 1, after that description in Luke 24, capturing Jesus saying, I'm coming back this same way that I just left. I'm coming for my disciples, I'm going to be seen only by them, and I'm going to shower down my blessings on them. Now that's a far cry from fiery vengeance, taking wrath on sinners. The second coming of Christ is like a flamethrower to the earth. Christ said prior to that, I'm going to get you with me so you can return behind the fire thrower and you're going to be arrayed following me. And that's a blessing. Well, those two big events, finally Paul explains that this private, seen only by believers, return of Christ was going to be a snatching. That's the word he uses. It's the Greek word harpazo. It's the Latin word. By the way, you wonder where rapture came from? It didn't come from somebody in the 19th century in Britain that thought it up. It came from actually the 3rd century and early 4th when uh, Vulgate was translated by Jerome in, in Bethlehem and he took the Greek harpazo and the only word he could think of in Latin that matched it was rapturos. So the rapture actually was invented, the word, by Jerome in the late second, or I mean late third, early fourth century time period when he did the Vulgate. But basically Paul says that it is a private snatching that takes place in the twinkling of an eye and involves only Christ's church who are living and dead, not Israel. That's what the Bible says. And then Paul adds that what follows is a judgment of the faithfulness of every believer as the fires of Christ beam a seat, burn. So, basically, if we could take the same chart uh, with, you know, everything that, that already is in the book of Revelation, this is where the two events would take place. The rapture of John 14, Luke 24, Acts 1, 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians 4 is right at the end of the church's ministry period for the Lord on earth, and he takes the church out of this world. But the next event 
is the Bema seat of Christ. And those are the extras Paul gives to fit into the seven-part grid of Revelation. So like a map of God's plans for earth, us in the church and all lost people and the Jews, that's what God says is my plan. And most dispensational Bible teachers who interpret the Bible primarily as literal in the normal sense see that clear difference and hold to something very similar to these seven events. And now we come to chapter 6. So look, take your Bibles to chapter 6. You were looking down at them. And let me give you, in the next about four minutes, the whole sixth chapter. And uh, Bonnie said to me, don't do it too fast. And I said, I'm not going to. I'm going to do it slow. We are looking at the horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, I just grabbed off, you know, how do you like that fanciful, futuristic picture that someone, actually the first person that tried to draw that was Albrecht Durer. And he did it in the 15th century in a woodcut when they were starting Gutenberg, you know, the whole Bible printing thing. You know, they put pictures back then because a lot of people couldn't read. And uh, it's been uh, enlarged upon since. But if you apply the insights of our almighty returning king, you can survey the book of Revelation chapter 6. And here's how it goes. Seal number one is that global deception. That's the first two verses. The white horse and rider is, is representing global deception, false peace, prosperity, and the rise of the Superman called the Antichrist. And what happens during this first seal? The Antichrist rises as a Superman in the world. First agenda, he solves the Arab-Israeli problem. Did you hear while we were still picking up our firecrackers that Israel bombed again Syria and again Russia sent the most advanced anti-ship missiles in the world called the Arhanat and they sent them to the Syrians who were going to transfer them to Hezbollah who was going to shoot them at whoever they want to. And so Israel, while we were recovering from the 4th of July, destroyed those. See, it's amazing that it's in the news all the time and Russia's mad and Syria's mad and Iran's mad and the U.S. is kind of miffed that we didn't let, you know, them help us, help them do that. But he's going to solve all of that problem, Daniel 9, 27 says. He's going to make a peace agreement between all billion, 200 million Muslims and the 7 million Jews. And they're going to kiss and make up. And so much so that the Muslims allowed the Jews to build a temple on the Dome of the Rock spot by it. In fact, the Bible says, if you look at Revelation 11:1, 1, that they're side by side. It says, here's the holy place, and there's the abomination. They're just beside each other. And only the Antichrist, Superman, could do that. And all that probably takes about 42 months. Well, the second seal, that's the third and fourth verse, is the global warfare that ensues. The red horse and rider is the rapid spread of the revived Roman Empire's widening conquest of humanity. I mean, he is pacifying the Muslims and the Jews while he's conquering the whole world. And through bloodshed and war, God tells us he takes peace. The peace that he came in with, he takes away, killing warfare and death from fighting. Third seal is Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. That's the black horse and rider. It's the spread of famine and scarcity and all the upheaval and all the unrest and all the warfare disrupt the global food supply chain. And there's widespread starvation in the world. And it's amazing how, you know, with our genetically modified seeds, if you miss, you know, you can't plant last year's crop. If it's genetically modified, you need fresh or it mutates. So it's very interesting how we're, we're working toward this. But the fourth seal in Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8 is the pale horse and rider. It's the horrific duo of death and Hades. Death takes the body, the grave, or Hades takes the soul. And the means of such death across the world will be all the warfare, the famine, which are the second and third seals, plus the addition, most likely, of pestilences and plagues. That's what the beasts of the earth, Therion, might mean. And in fact, that's what Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the first guy, you know, the microscope maker from Holland, when he looked into a drop of water, he says, behold the therion, the beasts. He was talking about those microscopic creatures. All told, the first half of the tribulation seven years, which is Daniel's 70th week, is a net loss of one in four humans, 1.750 billion. Now, by the way, what most people don't realize is God hasn't done anything yet. Think about that. The fifth seal is the prayers of the martyrs. 
The prayers of the martyrs are unleashed. They're in heaven, so they're perfected. Nothing they do is wrong or sinful. So it is righteous in heaven to ask God to judge the evildoers on this earth. And the martyrs pray, and God powerfully responds. And those prayers break forth in the next seal. You know, as if a global dictator and global wars and famines and pestilence and death aren't enough, now, at their prayers, God's wrath clicks in. And all the troubles of the tribulation so far, a fourth of the people are dead. Is generated only by humans. Now comes a little taste of the wrath of God. And the sixth seal, by the way, I really believe that, that Revelation 6 encompasses the entire tribulation. The first four seals are up to the midpoint. Then the Antichrist shows his stuff, breaks the covenant, and starts destroying or trying to destroy the Jews. The fifth seal is the byproduct of all that death. I mean, Christians aren't very liked now. They're going to be even less liked when he's taken over, and there's going to be an immense amount of martyrdom. But those prayers around the throne cause a cosmic quaking. That's the end of Revelation. And the wrath of God is unleashed, and the whole earth shakes, literally. What an awful time it will be. God unleashes six forms of wrath and touches seven levels of human society. Here's, you can look, it's right in your Bible. When he opened the sixth seal, behold, there was a great earthquake. That's the first one. The sun becomes black. That's the second cosmic event. The moon becomes like blood, thirdly. The stars of heaven fell to the earth like a fig tree drops late figs when shaken by a mighty wind. Just boop. And then, I mean, did you see the little meteor that went through Russia a while back? I mean, it was playing endlessly on the internet. That one little meteorite, which was very small, by standards of what's out there, sent a, in a shock wave, a sound wave that circled the whole earth twice. It was so powerful. Uh, it just scared people to death. Can you imagine if the Lord just, he says, okay, we'll do a little celestial, you know, fireworks display for you, and he lets all of that debris out there just start dropping through the atmosphere at once. The stars of heaven fall to earth. Verse 14 says, in the process of this, the sky recedes like a scroll when it's rolled up. And look at this, there is crustal. You know, the, the, um, there are many sciences of the earth. There's a geodesy and isostasy and, you know, all the different geological studies. And basically what they say is that the core of the earth is kind of like this hot rock and metal and, and, and the crust is just sitting kind of like it's kind of like when you're uh, making candy and a, and a little bit of the um, foam just stays on the surface of that boiling stuff and it just sits there. The crust of the earth is a little thin, uh, kind of like a potato chip on top of a boiling cauldron. And what happens is the Lord lets it all start moving. And instead of one quake, it says the whole earth, every mountain, every island, Everything moves. By the way, the, the mountains are both on the surface and under the ocean, and the islands of the sea are actually mountains, and everything moves. And all of a sudden, the world says, wow. And look what it says in verse 15. Every level of society gets shaken by God. The kings of the earth, then the, the great, then the rich, then the commanders, then the mighty, every slave, every free man. And look, here's where the real estate gets pricey. They hide themselves in caves and the rocks and mountains. And they say the mountains and rocks fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the lamb. The lamb? That's Jesus. That's the one that the liberals say, oh, he's too nice to do anything bad. Mean, he won't say anybody to hell. Look, the world testifies the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? So, God sent the book of Revelation to emphasize the glory and power of Christ. Why? So we, his church, can be boldly praying. God says, I want to do great, exceeding great and mighty things above all you could ask or think. I want you to go out and do what I've called you to do, and I have the power, and I am with you. Bold prayers. Focus ministries. If you know everything's going to burn up, why spend your life collecting stuff that everyone's going to argue over when you die and they're going to put on the trash or eBay it or hoard it themselves till they die and can pass it out again? Why? Why keep the cycle going? Why not confidently live our lives seeing Jesus Christ as he is, risen, walking among us in his church, coming in fire indignation? We don't have to take vengeance on those who reject him. He will. We just love them. Finally, 
God wants every church of every generation to study the revelation to know what exactly he left us to do. We're to go into all the world and declare the wonders of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the gospel. That's our mission in life. That's what we're going to answer for. It is Bema Seat. We're going to have to answer whether we did what he left us to do. How good and faithful are we being today as his servants? That's all that matters forever. Let's stand for a word of prayer. And as we stand... I would like to invite you, before you have to crawl into a rock and a cave, under a rock and into a cave to hide, why not call out to the Lord today? I'm sure that in a packed in group like this, there's at least one kind of uh, tag along that have gone to church, have said all this, but the message has never gone the 18 inches from you know it to you have embraced it yourself. Most people will miss heaven in America, at least, by just that distance. They know it all. They've heard it. The Christian bookstores all over the country. They probably have a Bible, if not at home, in every hotel room. But it never takes a transforming, piercing entrance to their hearts. Jesus Christ, the one we just talked about, is actually here. He attends Calvary and every other place where the gospel is preached. All you have to do is reach out for him. He is drawing you right now. He is convicting you of your sins. And he says, I'm not far from any one of you. While you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. You could come to Christ today. If you know Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, we're going, as soon as I say amen, I'm going to go and change my shoes and and go out and start the baptism. And I hope all of you come. We're going to sing in between, but it's just the first thing before we eat. But if you do know Jesus Christ, you need to be baptized into his name as a believer consciously, not as an infant unconsciously. That was a nice dedication. You need to publicly say, I'm in Christ. I'm unashamedly a part of his family. And we have room for all of you. They refill the baptistry as needed, okay? And it will be a great time. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you would draw to yourself anyone today that realizes that they are helplessly, hopelessly lost in need of a free gift that you purchased in your own body on the tree when you became sin for us. And Lord, I pray that you will begin a, the work of regeneration, a new heart, a new spirit inside of some. And for us who know you, may we be bold as we pray May we be focused as we live. May we be confident because we know how it all ends. And I pray that we would live intentionally because that's what you gave us this book for. In the name of Jesus, we thank you and pray for your blessing on our lives as we live them for your glory. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. See you straight that way. In 15 minutes, the baptism starts at high noon.